Here's a presentation that I gave to my classes recently about the physics of the movie Interstellar. Just a heads up, there will be spoilers here. I'm not going to give away entire sections of the plot or even the main plot, but I will be talking about specific events in the movie. And so if you see it, you might recognize a scene and you'll know what's going to happen. First thing to talk about is the physicist, this man named Kip Thorne. He's a theoretical physicist. He's worked on black holes. He is the authority, probably worldwide, on gravitation and black holes and that uh, part of modern physics. He wrote uh, a popular book called Black Holes and Time Warps, uh, which is where I got a lot of information for this. And uh, he's also written textbooks on gravitation. And if you read this book, Black Holes and Time Warps, you'll notice some similarities between it and the movie. One of the reasons is probably that he was also one of the executive producers of the movie. He was, uh, he's still around, he was with the movie makers, helping them produce it, help them make it, uh, get the physics right and everything. In fact, um, the scenes of the office of the scientist are all, the walls are all blackboards. The equations that are there were written by Kip Thorne, so those are real equations. Um, the main topic we're going to talk about is black holes. And we're going to talk about the history of them and what they are and how they work. So just some basic background. Uh, if you take a ball and you throw it into the air, it'll come back down. If you throw it faster, then it'll go higher. Theoretically, if you threw something fast enough, it would never come back down. And how fast you have to throw something in order to get it to never come back down depends on the strength of gravity. So the stronger the gravity, the faster you have to throw that object for it to never come back down. Now, this is all known theory. In the 1700s, I, uh, Newton had worked on gravity, the basic idea. They knew or thought the light was a corpuscle or a particle, and they knew the speed of light. They had calculated it by observing the moons going around Jupiter. Um, and so they had this idea. Could something have so much gravity that uh, the escape velocity would be greater than the speed of light. So in other words, it would have so much gravity not even light could escape. And in 1783, a man named John Mitchell calculated the critical circumference that would not allow corpuscles, the, corp the light, to escape. But that idea didn't last very long. There was not really much of a way to test it or um, find out any more about it. And then in the 1800s, they discovered that light was actually a wave. And since it was a wave and had no mass, it was not affected by gravity. Later on, they found that light is a wave and a particle, but since the particle had no mass, it would still not be affected by gravity. Um, until 1915, when Einstein said that this is not true. Uh, the reason can kind of be thought of this way. Um, in Newton's theory of the universe, space and time are two separate things. And they're also separate from the masses, these large objects like stars or black holes or planets. It's as if the, those objects are marbles or large balls on top of a flat surface, a flat table or something like that. Einstein said that matter and space actually interact with each other. And that space and time are one fabric. So instead of talking about space and time as separate things, we talk about the one space-time and that fabric. In Newton's theory, you know, a marble uh, would be, it would kind of be like putting on a flat green. Uh, something goes in a straight line just across that flat surface. Einstein's theory of gravity says that massive objects are going to bend the surface. So it would be like putting on a green with hills and valleys, and the particles are going to follow those hills and valleys. And so, in Einstein's theory, even light, which is not which has no mass, would still follow this curvature of space-time, as if it was on this curved surface. So the idea was that light would bend around a really massive object, for example, like the sun. And uh, there was a, another problem that Einstein's theory solved, specifically the, um, there was a problem with um, Mercury's orbit. But they also wanted to test out this idea that it would um, large objects would bend light. And the only nearby very large object where they could observe this was the sun. The problem is the sun blocks out the light from the stars behind it. So we couldn't see if the sun was actually bending the light. 
until Arthur Reddington got the idea to do an observation of a star just past the sun during a solar eclipse. And so he went to Chile um, in the early 1920s or late 1910s, and he discovered that the light does bend around the sun. During a solar eclipse, he was able to get a viewing of this distant star, and this was a big deal because now we had an, an Englishman verifying the theory of a German post World War One. So now, you know, the British and the Germans have been fighting, but now we have concord and harmony and people working together towards uh, progress and science and that sort of thing. It was a big deal. Um, one of the interesting things, though, is that nobody can find the plates from Eddington's observation. So the question, did he really make that observation or not? Uh, thankfully, the theory has been verified many times since, but it's an interesting historical note about that particular observation. Um, so now that we know that light and gravity do interact, there's the question, can there be enough gravity to stop light from going out? Could we have this thing called a black hole? Which they didn't call a black hole, by the way, at the time. Uh, that name was developed by John Wheeler uh, later. And Einstein said, no, this thing is not possible. He actually said there ought to be a law of the universe preventing such objects from existing. Arthur Eddington, the great astronomer, also said, no, not possible. However, in 1931, there was a young Indian student named um, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, and on his way to England, after finishing his undergraduate degree, on his way to earn his graduate degree in England, on the boat, on the way there, he wrote two papers. One was published right away. The other one was proving that black holes could exist, but very few people could understand the proof that he gave. He gave it to his advisor, and he had a question about it, had it cleared up. Still, it wasn't being published. Uh, Chandrasekhar got frustrated, sent it to America. People there had to send it around to get it decided on. And uh, it was finally decided it was a good paper, and it was uh, published. However, Chandrasekhar uh, didn't make a huge splash right away. In fact, a lot of scientists ignored it, and they didn't, they continued to think that black holes weren't possible. There was even a case where Eddington uh, publicly ridiculed Chandrasekhar during a conference. He was on stage, and Chandrasekhar was in the audience, and Chandrasekhar turned to his advisor and he said, look, I can prove this guy wrong. The arguments he's using don't make any sense. I can use the equations. And his advisor said, no, don't worry, Eddington's old, he'll die soon, and then your theory can move forward. And, and it did. Um, but for a while, nobody would believe Chandrasekhar, and, but even though he had provided a proof. So this is one of those historical examples of science, scientific progress being impeded by the uh, oppressive forces of other scientists. The simple fact is that even science is a human endeavor and as such suffers from human um, personalities and prejudices and biases. It's not a clear-cut, pure, um, idealistic endeavor as we like to think it is sometimes. So what is a black hole? Main idea is that there's so much mass in such a small space that the gravitational force is so strong not even light can escape. Um, to be more exact, it's, it's uh, bending space-time so much that the light loses all of its energy by the time it gets out. We'll talk more about that later. And since nothing, not even light, can escape, this a term called a black hole was termed. Um, since light can't get out, there's no communication. You know, radio waves, for example, are a main mode of distant communication, but radio waves are forms of light. And since not even light can get out, those radio waves would die by the time they reached the edge of the black hole. Um, the point where light no longer goes past, that's called the event horizon. You can see it here in this um, picture. Anything that happens just outside the event horizon can reach the outer world. Anything that happens just inside the event horizon will be pulled back in, and there's no communication past this point. Um, so uh, what does a black hole look like? It's right here. You see it? Against a pure black background, it would not look like anything. It would just look like more of the same blackness. Um, so then the question is, what evidence is there? And first thing, the equations. As Chandrasekhar showed, 
the equations require at least the possibility of black holes based on the laws of science as they understood them at the time, based on general relativity, which had been um, at least verified partially by that time, then these things have to be possible. And that brings me to an important uh, parenthetical but profound remark about the nature of science and math. The fact that math can be used to describe the natural world is a really startling thing. It doesn't have to be that way. And scientists who write about these things will often comment on how profound this really is. That we can do algebra, which is an abstract thing, and by just by doing math, that can describe reality, but also by doing math we can come up with new things about reality. We can make predictions based on the results of equations. It's a really mind-blowing idea, this relationship between math and science. And it doesn't have to be that way. It's not a trivial thing. Um, you know, as if, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Once we define those things, then it's, it's trivial. That has to be the case that 2 plus 2 is 4. But this doesn't have to be that way. Um, and it's something that scientists often marvel at. Back to the evidence for black holes. We, there's also a thing called microlensing. If there's a black hole in between a distant star and the Earth, what will happen is the light going directly towards the Earth through the black hole will, will get, quote, sucked up, sort of, in the black hole. But the light going just past the black hole will actually be bent around the black hole, and then this star will appear brighter on Earth because the light has been bent. It's been uh, focused, you could say, like a lens. See the word lens in here in microlensing. And this has been observed. We've even seen distortion of light from distant galaxies. Um, and the evidence, or the explanation, is this microlensing that there's a black hole in between. Um, also, we see revolving objects at the center of our galaxy. Uh, it's close enough that we can see some of the stars going around. And these are whole stars, you know, things like or much larger than the sun revolving around some central object. The central object isn't seen, and so it's inferred that that must be a black hole exerting an incredible gravitational force. Also, uh, feeding black holes have been observed. When a black hole is pulling things in, there are a couple of visible objects. One is what's called an accretion disk. And this is not a real image. I, I made this image myself on my laptop. But around the black hole, there's this accretion disk. It's um, sort of like, you know, our solar system is a disk. It's, according to the laws of physics, it's just the best way for things to rotate. It's just the, um, you know, galaxies form disks. The rings around Saturn form a disk. And these particles, whatever they are, gas particles, other objects, as they're being pulled in, they're traveling at extremely high velocities near the speed of light, and they're colliding with each other, and so giving off uh, incredible amounts of radiation. And so these accretion disks can actually be very, very bright, um, even brighter than stars, which brings us to a point how there could be life-sustaining planets potentially around a black hole, and a black hole doesn't produce light, which is true, but the matter going around the black hole would produce enough light to potentially support life um, on planets that are also revolving in stable orbits around that black hole. Um, some of these come in and they're so, some of these particles come in and are so energetic that they get shot out. Instead of going outward where they would run into other things here, they go kind of up and down, you could say, and they form these jets that go on for sometimes hundreds of light years with uh, very high radiation. These, if there's a feeding black hole at the center of a galaxy, sometimes they're so bright they're called quasars, and they're the brightest objects in the universe. So what's inside a black hole? We don't know. Again, we can't communicate with what's, with anything inside. Nothing can get from the inside to the outside, and therefore, we just don't know what's in a black hole. In fact, there are debates about whether or not the inside of a black hole is even part of our universe. Some scientists like to talk about the universe as simply what can be observed. And so if we cannot observe what's inside a black hole, then that's not part of our universe and therefore not even really a scientific question 
Others would like to argue that we can because we can use our laws of physics to at least make some predictions and there is the potential that maybe we can get some information out of a black hole um, and that was part of Hawking's contribution that maybe there's this thing called Hawking radiation that occurs at the event horizon and there's a potential to get information that way. Others say that inside a black hole maybe other universes are created and that would create sort of a natural selection for universes that are you know a stable universe that produces black holes you would get more of those types of universes some scientists say how could we show that, how can we prove it, what predictions would it make, and others say, well, it is scientific because we could test our universe to see if it fits that model. So it's really, this question is at the cutting edge of science and the philosophy of science and some of the debates that are still current in the world. Um, entering a black hole, what would that be like? Here's a, an illustration of the moon and the earth, and the moon is what's called uh, is gravitationally locked. We only see one face of the moon all the time. And one of the reasons is that the moon is actually uh, gravitationally distorted. It's not a perfect sphere. And the reason for that is this side of the moon that's closer to the Earth experiences more gravity than this side of the moon that's further away. If it's enough of a distance here that there's a difference felt by the moon in this gravitational force. <clears throat> Everything is attracted to the center of the Earth, and so the outsides of the Moon, these sides, are pulled in towards uh, that center point. So if the Moon had feelings, this is what it would feel like. It would feel like it's being stretched in this direction and compressed in this direction. Anything near a black hole experiences these forces, which are called tidal forces, to such an extreme degree that around certain black holes, any object would be ripped into its constituent subatomic particles. And... Uh, there's no cure for that, so don't try it. You know, other black holes that they wouldn't be ripped into the particles, but there would be enough force to definitely kill a human being. Um, and there's a term for this that I've actually read called spaghettification. Think of the word spaghetti. Things are spaghettified because they're stretched out and compressed and turned into spaghetti. Another thing that happens, as things are nearer to a black hole time slows down. And this is one of the places that the movie got it right, but also one of the places where the movie got it wrong. Um, the main character is concerned about going near the black hole because uh, too much time will pass. You know, you can see out here time's going kind of quickly, in here time's going slowly. Uh, the person near the black hole doesn't experience time any different, but once he comes away from the black hole then he'll find that you know, time out here had continued to go by at a much faster rate. And that's what the main character's main uh, concern is. The As I was watching the movie, I wasn't sure if the Endurance, the spaceship, was also orbiting around that planet. If it was, then the Endurance would have experienced the same time delay as the people on the planet. Being near the planet itself doesn't make any difference to this time delay. It would just be... Um, being near the black hole. And, uh, I mean, they may have have known about that, but just bent it for the sake of the plot. Um, you know, the other planets as well, being in really any vicinity in the black hole, there's going to be some time delay. And also, as the main character enters the black hole at one point, he would have experienced a greater time delay from that than anything else. As he's entering that black hole, potentially thousands of years would have gone by in the outside universe. Um, and that isn't what happens in the movie. Also because of this effect of the time slowing down, anything that goes into a black hole, uh, if a person went into a black hole for example and safely, he'd be able to look ahead of him and see everything that entered the black hole since it became a black hole. And he'd be able to look behind him and see everything that would fall into the black hole um, after him. And again the reason is even though an outside observer would see things entering that black hole thousands of years apart, for him it would be a matter of only maybe a few uh, seconds or something like that. Um, this idea about how what happens with light and time helps to illustrate what's actually happening with light. Light can't go slower than the speed of light. You know, it's still all light travels at the same speed, 
And so it's not as if the light particles are actually being slowed down. Instead, what's happening is that the light waves are stretching. Um, light waves are characterized by their wavelength. And so that's, and the, and the period. The period is the time it takes a light wave to go up and down one time. And so near the black hole, the time to go up and down once um, is a different time from what it would take to go up and down here. You know, one second here could be hours here. And so as these light particles go out, they're taking longer and longer to do one up and down. As, as, as the up and down time gets longer, then the wave gets stretched out and it loses energy. And so these, what's actually happening is time is distorted, the space-time. The time aspect is distorted so much that these light particles are stretched, uh, technical term redshifted, out of existence to the point where their energy is zero. The movie's black hole is actually the um, most accurate picture of a black hole that's ever been made. One, because it was an image generated by computers directly from the equations. And also, since it's Hollywood, they had the money to pay, you know, computer programmers and pay for the computers, the very strong computers necessary to compute for uh, over a year, the equations necessary to get a very accurate picture of a black hole. So not just in movies, but really anywhere, it's the most accurate depiction of a black hole that's ever been made. This is not it. Again, this is a picture I made. One of the surprising things for me seeing the movie was this, that we have the accretion disk, but looking at the black hole, if someone was over here looking at it, they wouldn't just see black emptiness above and below. Instead, they would see light from the accretion disk bent around the black hole. So the light on this side would actually get bent around, and someone on this side would see everything from this side of the black hole. Of course, it would be distorted, so it may not be... Um, you might not be able to interpret exactly what's there or see a very clear image. But this light would be coming around, and so there would be something like a halo around the black hole, like this. Now about wormholes. In 1985, Carl Sagan was finishing writing Contact, and he had this problem, how to get his main character from one part of the universe to another part of the universe very quickly, without a whole lot of time going by, either for the character or the people on Earth. You know, as we know, if something travels near the speed of light, very far away, then time goes by here on Earth at a different rate, and he wanted to avoid all that. So he went to his friend named Kip Thorne, and he asked him if he had any ideas about doing this. And Kip Thorne said, you know, let me think about it, and he came up with this idea of wormholes. And he actually started doing calculations and publishing papers on wormholes, and some of his friends were like, you know, you might not want to do that, you're going to lose your reputation as a scientist. He didn't, because he did heed warnings, and he uh, didn't go off the deep end. But this was an interesting case where the writing of science fiction actually sparked uh, a valid scientific idea. Usually it's the science uh, informing the science fiction purely. But this is a case where it worked backwards. Bottom line is, uh, wormholes are possible in theory, but not necessarily in the real world in practice. Wormholes potentially do exist, but they are so small and they last for such a short time, we don't really have any access to them. Um, there is the possibility, and really what the movie is about, is that there could be a super advanced society someday that learns how to make these wormholes and make them bigger and hold them open over a long period of time so they'd be accessible for people to travel through. The idea expressed in the movie is really straight out of the book Black Holes and Time Warps by Kip Thorne. And it's this, that there's sort of a, an underlying hyperspace um, above, you know, hyperspace means above space or kind of around, that space is sort of in the setting of hyperspace. So if we take space and space-time and crunch it down to two dimensions, and then the space could potentially be bent around, and so you'd get these corresponding points um, in space, because it's bent around in hyperspace, and you have these singularities that would meet up. Um, that's essentially what a wormhole is. So you've got these two distant points in the universe, or two different times you could even potentially have, and 
um, these could somehow match up. Exoplanets. Um, according to exoplanets.com on the 22nd of December, year 2014, there were um, over 1,500 confirmed exoplanets and 3, 000, over 3,000 unconfirmed candidates, so things that they think might be exoplanets, but they weren't really sure. The movie depicts exoplanets going around a black hole. I don't think there have been any de detected going around a black hole. Um, the reason in the movie they had to have a black hole was to complete the plot. If they had exoplanets just going around a star, then that wouldn't hold up very well. Um, also, the wormhole was necessary to get from our solar system to a black hole. And again, the black hole was needed for the plot. This idea that this um, future advanced society had somehow figured out gravity and been able to manipulate things. Um, the black hole was a necessary piece. The wormhole provides a way to get to that black hole without too much time going by on Earth. But anyway, these exoplanets are usually detected going around other stars. An exoplanet also extrasolar planet is another name for it. And the way that they're detected, the main way is this, that there's a gravitational force not only of the star pulling on the planet, but also the planet pulling on the star. You know, this is Newton's third law. When, you know, when two objects interact, they exert equal and opposite forces, or equal forces in opposite directions. And so as a planet goes around a star, this star will actually wobble a little bit. And that can be observed by telescopes, by observing the light, um, stretching out or being compressed, redshifting or blue shifting. And from that they're able to deduce that there are planets going around these stars. And like we saw there have been hundreds, literally hundreds of other planets going around other stars. Um, the quantum gravity problem plays a big role in the movie. It's uh, the main scientist is working on this problem because they think that if they can figure it out then they can figure out how to manipulate gravity and get, you know, save the people on Earth, how to get them off of the Earth into outer space to another planet, potentially. And uh, the problem is basically this. There are two very accurate theories at the moment. This is, a, this is a real problem in science, by the way. This isn't just part, just science fiction. There's quantum mechanics, which is incredibly accurate, and there's general relativity, which is incredibly accurate. The problem is they don't get along. When you put the two together, you have equations solving to infinity, which is not allowed. And so uh, string theory is one of the attempts to solve this, but there haven't been any predictions made by, testable predictions made by string theory yet. Um, and so this is, this is a problem uh, currently in science. Just a couple quick things about the basic physics in the movie. There's no way to artificially create gravity. Gravity results from mass, at least as we understand it right now. So in order to have the gravity of the Earth, you need the mass of the Earth, or something more dense, uh, you know, but a smaller radius. And so but what we feel is not so much gravity. What we feel is the floor pushing back up on us. And so the way to potentially simulate gravity, again, not create artificial gravity, but simulate it, would be to have something spinning around, which is shown a couple times in the movie with, uh, you know, an advanced society in sort of a big cylinder that's rotating, but also in on the Endurance. The Endurance is a spacecraft. It has sort of these pods all around. And as it spins, as anything like this spins, the floor is going to pull in with this, what's normally called centripetal force, uh, which is really just a, an applied force. It's not a specific kind of force like gravity or the strong force or electromag electromagnetic force or anything like that. <clears throat> um, and so spinning in space is one way to simulate gravity. And it's hard to tell to keep track in the movie of all the times where there actually is spinning taking place. It seems like when they first come back to the Endurance after being on that first planet, it's not spinning and yet they're walking. And so, uh, you know, if you see it again, keep an eye out for places where they're walking around the spaceship with this simulated gravity, but they're not actually uh, spinning at the time. Another interesting thing, it's kind of a nitpicky point. Again, all these things I'm sure they knew about, but they had to change for the sake of the plot of the movie. As the Endurance is spinning, it has a specific axis of rotation. In other words, right through the center, this thing would be spinning. However, at one point, um, 
a part of the um, endurance gets blown off. And if that happened, then as this thing is spinning, it would be on a different axis of rotation. As they're trying to reconnect to the endurance, it shows the endurance spinning very quickly, but all about that single axis. You know, as if nothing had changed about the uh, inertia or the, the makeup of the endurance. Um, instead, what would be happening as this thing was spinning very quickly is that it would uh, be wobbling back and forth, and reconnecting really would have been impossible. But, again, for the sake of the movie, I'm sure they they changed that, and uh, it would have drastically changed the plot and the possibilities in the movie had they been true to that particular piece of science. So anyway, those are the main points I wanted to make about the physics of the movie Interstellar. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the movie.